family and friends, welcome out to another Impact Relationship Academy. I'm Anthony, this is my lovely wife, Rhonda Crawford. We're ready to tag team to do some damage to the devil so that your family and mine, our relationships can continue to grow healthy and strong and we cannot succumb to the attacks that wind up trying to divide us. Now listen, we got some great stuff in store for you, so I hope that you're ready. If you haven't already, be sure to share this with somebody, invite a family member or friend, host a watch party if you're on Facebook, say come on and connect with us because this is going to help your family get stronger and stronger. Now just before we launch off into the Word of God, you know, for tonight, let me share this with you. On Saturday, February the 20th, we want to invite you to come out. We have uh, adopted a part of the neighborhood here in the city of Hollywood, you know, where we are based, and we're going to be going out on that Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to noon just to be a blessing in the community. We're going to be doing some cleanup, just blessing the residents and the like, so we want to encourage you to come on out on that Saturday. You can register for it. Go to icevents.eventbrite.com. That's how you can register for it, and you can get in on it, and we're going to have an amazing time because impact is who we are, and impact is what we do. Praise God. Honey, come on, pray for us, and let's jump into things. Father, we just thank you once again for another opportunity to delve into your word uh, with our Impact Relationship Academy. We thank you, Father, for everyone that is joining us, for all the families that are represented here today. And we thank you, Father, whatever time they're watching us, whatever situations are going on in their lives and in their families, that your word presents life, it presents peace, Father, it presents wisdom, and it allows them now, Father, to latch on to what you say and see change, see transformation, see health come in their lives and in their families. And so, Father, we speak that now, we expect that now, Lord God. We come against every demonic attack that would uh, try to dull the efficacy of your word and we say father that your word goes forth unhindered right now we thank you for it in jesus name we're expecting great things amen 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 i agree i agree i agree here here's what we want to focus in on right right from the beginning in first timothy chapter 6 verse 12 it says this fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Here's what we want to deal with on tonight. And we actually, we're going to deal with it tonight. We're not going to be able to finish. I already know that. So we're going to come back to it on next month as well. You, I want you to understand that we need you to fight for your family. Come on, say it with me. I'm fighting, I'm fighting for my family. For my family. Now, how you do that is key because... Conflict and fights happen in every family. Come on. My, my wife and I, we've had some fights. Not physical fights, but arguments or disagreements and the like. And how you do it, you know, has a huge bearing on the success and peace that gets developed into the family. So this is a message I want to tell you right now. We want to encourage you to lock in on and to review on a regular basis. And it will help to watch this quail, you know, some of the conflicts that try to come up in our families. You start talking about fighting for your family. Uh, I'm reminded of Abraham and his nephew Lot. Abraham, you know, and his uh, nephew Lot have gotten separated. You know, both of them are doing, you know, extremely well. Uh, Lot takes, you know, some of the best land that's out there, you know, in Canaan. He pitches his tent towards Sodom. It, it says Abraham has his whole region and he's doing well. But then things happen where there is a conflict going on with Sodom, Gomorrah, and some of the other cities around there. And they are fighting and they're taking people captive and they wind up taking Lot captive captive. Man, Abraham found out about that. He got all of his hired servants and all those that were working for him, all of his men. It was like 300, I think 18 of them. And they said, we're going to get my nephew. And see, I love that spirit. When something happens with a member in your family, you got to be willing to fight for them. And listen, you got to be willing to put yourself in harm's way to go rescue them, praise God. Don't just let them just wind up succumbing to the attacks that have, you know, pulled them away and brought them into captivity. You ought to think of yourself as the one who has the anointing to remove the burden and to destroy the yoke and be able to make them 
free, praise God. So have that kind of heart that Abraham had, you know, for his nephew, Lot. So here's a few admonitions we want to give you, praise God, just to get started, you know, so you can understand. What you got, babe? Well, you know, that was that was just, you know, a really great example with Abraham and Lot and him mm. really just fighting and not accepting that, you know, this family member was going to be now destroyed. Mm. And so some areas that we want to apply that to, first we want to talk about married couples. Mm. Married couples, we want to encourage you and employ you today. You can't give up on God and you can't give up on each other. That's good. I don't know what it may be looking like right now. I don't know what you may be going through, but we want to just uh, really stress this home to you. It's time to fight for that relationship. Fight for your relationship with God and fight for your relationship with others. And you can't sit back either and watch you know, your spouse fade from God, watch your spouse fade from you, things growing distant and becoming more and more far apart and just allow it to happen. We want to just kind of put some Holy Ghost fire up under you right now and really call you to action, call you, you know, to get up from a place of just accepting things the way they are and fight for your marriage. Uh, you know, I love that. I, I want to chime in right there because uh, a lot of times we can see it happening with different members of our family that they're starting to fade from God. You see them starting to kind of become distant from you. That's not a time just to kind of sit back and be like, well, you know, I'm not going to bother them. I'm going to let them work through it. Well, yes, yeah, sometimes people need a little bit of space, but even if you're giving them some space, you ought to be attacking things spiritually by praying for them and speaking life over them. And then you want to do whatever you need to do to get after them so that they don't drift from God and certainly don't drift from you. Listen, if they drift from God, they're going from you. So, so when you see that drift starting, you have to be intentional to say, no, no, come on back, baby. You know, come, come on back, son, daughter. Come on. This, this is where God has called for you to be. And I'm going to fight for you to keep this fervent relationship with your good, good father. What else we got there, baby? So now we want to talk about our singles. Yeah. So our singles, here's our encouragement to you. We don't want you to drift from God. So you don't want to sit back and drift from God or watch your brother or your sisters in Christ just kind of fade up, fade into the distance from God without putting up a fight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's time for us to stop living on an island. It's time for us to just kind of um, be consumed with me, myself, and I, and what I need, and my four and no more. And it's time for us to really be paying attention to the other people that God has placed in our lives, and he has called us to be a blessing to, so that when we see certain things going on with them, we can now be that person, that person of strength, that person of encouragement, that person to help them get up and fight for the things that are going on in their lives as well. Mm, that's good. Parents, we can't let our children treat God like a distant, hardly ever seen relative. So, so all these other things, you know, that wind up being more important, you know, in their lives, you know, like, you know, video games or social media or sports, you know, even school, we don't want those things to become more important to them than the relationship that they have with God. You want to fight for your children's health and wealth with Almighty God. And that means you have to be intentional. It doesn't just happen, you know, by happenstance. It's not going to happen just simply because you're praying. You need to make sure you are acting on your prayers and making sure you're helping your children line up in relationship with God and helping to keep them healthy. One of the things that we uh, started to do this year, uh, and it was my wife's idea, and I, I loved it, you know, on uh, you version that they have, you know, various plans that you can, you know, read through the Bible and, and so forth. So we're reading through the Bible, you know, again this year, but we're doing it together as a family, and we have all of our children involved in it, and it gives you, you know, what to read, you know, each day, and then at the end of each day, everyone has to chime in and write their comments. What is the Lord saying to you out of this that you read today? And now here it is, we're over in the February, and all four of them are sticking right in there to it, you know, keeping, you know, their reading going on. You know, somebody may slip behind a day or so, but then they pick right back up. It's a great way, watch this, to help keep them growing in God. You got to fight, parents. Got to make sure you fight for those children. And another thing, parents, we can't allow our children to be disrespectful to us or allow them to strive against or with their siblings. Mm, yeah. So we, we have to, we have to, you know, come in between those types of issues and we've got to bring in not just, you know, um, that we're upset with them and, you know, that we're reprimanding them, but we need to instruct them with the word of God. What does the word of God 
say about how to handle conflict? What does the word of God say about how you should respond to me as your parent? And infusing them with the understanding of we, we, we base our lives based on what the word says. Mm, we make decisions based upon the word says. We operate in friendships. And you're not too young to operate in a friendship the way that God has set for us to operate in his word. So we want to infuse the word of God in every situation and everything that we're doing. And we're not just coming at them, you know, telling them that they've done something wrong or they need to do this or that. But we're instructing them on how to now live and how to make wise decisions. And, you know, sometimes it may make us uncomfortable. Sometimes it may cause us to now, instead of being able to be free to do something that we want to do, well, we got to make sure we're spending time with the kids. We got to make sure that we're making ourselves available to them and that we are actually imparting into them instead of, you know, a lot of times because we think we're all in the same house, we're spending time together. Mm -hmm. But just because we're all in the same house and somebody's in their room watching TV and somebody else is in their room playing video games and somebody else is off, you know, doing something else, well, that's not really spending time together. It's bringing everyone together and submitting our schedule to one of the greatest priorities in our lives, and that is our families. Wow, that's great stuff, great stuff. Let, let me speak to the students and children. You can't drift from your family believing nobody understands you. Well, one of the common deceptions that has existed for ages is that teenagers and the like begin to develop this mindset that, you know what, my parents just don't understand. I, I went through it, you know, when, when I was a teen. You, did you go through it as well? We, we, we all, you know, go through it. And it's one of the biggest deceptions because, listen, your parents were teenagers just like you are today made some bonehead decisions probably just like maybe you what you may have done you cannot allow yourself to drift from your family because you buy into this mindset of well they just don't understand so therefore you start to create a new family outside of your family with your friends and the like because you feel like they get you and they understand you don't allow that to happen children students you got to fight to stay right there with your family praise God and then the last we got there um, and then, you know, we want to also just fight for the unborn. Amen. You know, we want to fight for uh, those developing little people that mm -hmm. are in the wombs of, you know, uh, other humans that um, many times, unfortunately, people make a decision not to bring all the way and to, to give birth to. You know, we, we want to be there. And, and really, we want to come to someone who is in a situation where they have this pregnancy and they don't know what to do. We want to come to them with the heart of love, the love of God, the love of God that says, hey, God is here with you and for you, and he has a way. He has a way of escape for you. He has something uh, in his plan that will help you in this situation and bring you, if you have this child, provide for you, bring you whatever you need, whatever resources are necessary so that you can have the life that he has for you. Mm, that's good. So, so in a nutshell, none of us can just sit back and watch our family members suffer through life without God and watch this, and end up in hell, or just go through a life, praise God, you know, that's kind of a, a, a life of hell. We should never see that. For, for, for no one in our family, not, not our spouses, not, not, not children, not, not siblings, you know, not cousins, not uncles, aunties, nieces, nephews, it doesn't matter. Fight for your family. But now we want to do it God's way, though. We, we don't want to just, you know, just put up, you know, our physical dukes and, and act like we're going to force someone to, you're going to follow God. Come on now, some of y'all know you kind of came up, you know, in that area and, and generation, your parents was like, boy, you going to church, you know, you, you going to church and you're just like, okay, you know, you, you did it, you know, but you, you were never, you know, kind of fully submitted, you know, to the process. Well, yeah, there's, there's, there's room for encouragement, you know, there, but, but at the same token, we can't force another person 
person to do something that they don't want to do. Anyone now who is convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. You got to make it an effort now to appeal to their heart to say, wait a minute, with God is where you were designed to be. With God is your best life. With God is where he has called for you to be. Come on and take some steps towards him today. So we look right here and understand this, you know, component that all family members, or all family problems, I should say, wind up being centered around some type of conflict. And we just want to look at, you know, how do we fight through uh, those kind of conflicts and win our family members. Now listen, when we talk about win on our family members, we're talking about keeping them close to God and keeping them close to us. That is the win. Keeping your family close to God and close to us. It's not enough for them just to be close to you. They need to be close to God first, and then watch this, you'll find that the relationship between the two of you will be even sweeter, praise God. So, we want to look at some things here about, you know, how, you know, uh, we can apply some practical steps. So, what, what you got there, baby, to lead us off? Okay, well, firstly, I just wanted to say this, is that we have to remember that when there is a conflict in our families, that we're on the same team. Yeah. So, it's not... I'm on this side and you're on that side and we are both trying to jockey for our position to be the one that is promoted. When there is a conflict, we remember that, you know what, we are on the same team. If I lose, the team loses. Yeah. If they lose, the team loses. So it's not about me necessarily trying to promote my position and to make that person submit to what I believe needs to be done or needs to be said or what we need to do. Instead, we have to come to a place where I recognize how can we bring this together to a place of harmony. Mm -hmm. Some people feel like harmony is my way. <laughs> uh -oh. We got to lose that way of thinking. Harmony has to be God's way. Yeah, there it is. And so that's what we want to talk about. We want to fight, but we want to fight in the right way. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing we want to share with you is that fighting starts with forgiveness. Oh, uh, yeah. We're going we're gonna to put on some boxing gloves. You know, you know, just kind of illustrate, you know, but, you know, we, we wind up, you know, you know, forsaking that. But we want you to understand the picture that if you're going to fight for your family, it starts with forgiveness. You have to be willing to release them for whatever wrong that you may feel like they have done to you or maybe that they actually have done to you. And the way that looks, you know, if we did have, you know, those boxing gloves on, that means you got to take the gloves off. Ah. The boxing gloves got to come off. They got to be put down to the side. And it's not about now me making that person come to the place where they recognize how bad they were and how horrible what they did was. But now it's a place of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so we got to give up being mad. We got to give up being bitter. We have to decide that, you know what? It's more important for, for me and my family to be in peace than for me to be right in this situation. Mm -hmm. yep. That's what we have to come to. And sometimes that, that decision for forgiveness is something that you just you may want to keep to yourself because going to the person and say, you know what, I forgive you for how horrible you were yesterday. What, what, who, who are you talking to? You the one that was horrible. Huh? I should that be might forgiving not, you. That might not be the best thing to do. <laughs> yeah. But you know in your heart yeah. that Whatever it is that rubbed you the wrong way, you're letting it go. You're taking the gloves off, and you're not holding them accountable for whatever it is. That's good. That's good. So now, with everything, we apply God's word on this. So these are not, watch this, just, you know, some type of good counseling tips. This is God's word. And when you get God's word on a matter, God respects for you and I to respond to that word. So notice what the Lord Jesus says here in, in Matthew chapter 18. Well, go, go ahead, honey, please. Verses 21, starting at verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Oh my. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. 
But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with, with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? That's good stuff. That's good stuff. And you know what? I think one of the most... Um, Thing, one of the things that stands out the most as you read this verse is that this person couldn't pay the debt that he owed his master. Mm -hmm. And we have to come to the fact of realization that whatever wrong was done to us, that person cannot pay it. Mm -hmm. They can't turn back the hands of time and redo what happened. We, we, we don't time travel right now. Nobody has invented that yet. Mm -hmm. So what happened has happened. They can't erase the situation that happened out of your memory. It's always going to, uh, you're always going to have the opportunity to bring it up and to think back on it. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing that someone can do to actually fully give the payment for whatever wrong they have done to us. So we have to come to the place just like this master did and just like he wanted his servant to do. That you know what? I am removing the requirement of repayment from you. You no longer owe me anything. It is my decision now that I am placing upon you. I will no longer hold you to account for this debt that I believe that you owe to me. The longer we hold it over them, the longer and the more poisonous the relationship becomes. So we have to come to the place where we say, you know what? Even if you, even if you try, you couldn't repay me. So I'm not going to hold it against you. Mm -hmm. Just like even if I tried, I couldn't repay God for the debt that was there against me for all of the years of things that I've done wrong and things right now that I may do wrong. There is nothing I can do to turn back the hands of time to make it not happen. So, Father, thank you for just forgiving me. Yeah. And because you forgive me, I can forgive somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes the person you have to forgive is yourself. That's good. Sometimes it's you that you have to say, you know what? I messed up in this relationship. I did something here. I did this to this person. But I'm going to forgive myself the way God forgave me. Mm, that's good. You know, Peter had an issue with this just like you and I probably have some issue with it sometime. And that's why Peter asked. And he thought he was doing something good. He said, look, Jesus, how often, you know, should I forgive my brother? Now, the context of the discussion here was in one day. He says, should I forgive him seven times? In other words, what Peter was saying, if I forgive him seven times and the eighth time he does it again, can I knock his teeth out? That, I mean, that, that, that was Peter's kind of, you know, mindset here. And Jesus messes him up. He says, oh, no, 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 no. To forgive him 70 times seven in one day. 490 times. Now, obviously, Jesus wasn't saying you'll keep track, you know, up to, you know, 490. What he's saying is that forgiveness is always supposed to be there. And always supposed to be extended just like it has been extended to you and I. Here, here's a particular case that we have to recognize. That there is no issue, no wrong that has been done to us that uh, trumps and causes us to excuse ourselves, I should say, from forgiving someone else. Sometimes we can feel like you don't understand what they did to me. What, whatever it is, it pales in comparison to the forgiveness that God has extended unto all humanity. And that's why God is saying here, like, look, just like you saw with that one servant who owed a million dollars and he was forgiven, but then he turns around and holds someone who owes him thousands of dollars and throws them into prison. He says, no, you want to extend unto 
those people in your life forgiveness just like forgiveness was extended unto you because the debt that you and I owed was far more than what that person did to you or did not you know do for you see you have to have a heart that forgiveness has to always be applied come on say it with me out there forgiveness must always be applied listen we appreciate the forgiveness you know when we desire it we appreciate it from God we appreciate it from our spouse and other members of our family so then make sure now you extend it that same way now forgiveness requires us to adjust Requ forgiveness requires us to swallow pride forgiveness you know requires us now to maybe now we don't look like the big man in the room because we came in to say look you know what I'm sorry and I'm, I'm gonna tell you something especially in marriage and family, but for, for everyone, you, you can make great progress in your relationship when you just learn how to, you know, uh, apologize, even when you feel like you haven't done anything wrong. Uh, why, why, why am I going to do that? They the one that's wrong. Listen, if you all are in a conflict, both of y'all are wrong. So someone's got to be, watch this, big enough to take the step towards reconciliation. And that starts with forgiveness. Praise God. Yeah. You know, um, something you said that was great, and that is when you mentioned um, forgiving, even though you feel like you've done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. Because we have to remember that forgiveness is not a feeling. It's not something that we, um, we, we, we necessarily agree with with our emotions. Forgiveness is a decision. Yeah. Forgiveness is a decision. It's, it's, I'm simply, no matter how it feels right now, no matter how it looks right now, no matter what's going on, you know, jumping off on the inside of me right now, I make the decision in spite of how I feel to apply what God says and forgive you. And that's something that my feelings cannot uh, you know, override. My feelings cannot then cause me to backtrack because I've made a decision that's not dependent on what they say. Mm, that's good. That's good. Let, let's, let's give you the second key for fighting for your family and those relationships in your life. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 19 says this, a brother offended is harder to be won over than a strong city. And their contentions separate them like the bars of a castle. Yeah. A brother offended is harder to be won over than a strong city. The contention, now the strife, is, is separating you like bars in, in, in a castle. Bars in a jail cell. You can't get from this side and they can't get from their side. You have to come to a place where you relinquish that. And that's why, again, we say we start with forgiveness so that you can begin a reconciliation you know, process. So the second element here and key is schedule some time alone with just you and that family member on a neutral site. Schedule some time. Just, just, just you and them. Come on, let's, let's sit down and, and let's talk through this. You know, I love you and I know you love me. Come on, let's, let's get rid of these bars and let's begin to deal with something. We, we reference here about doing it on like a, a neutral site and doing it alone because you know how it is. Sometimes people like to perform before an audience. So you get other people around and so forth and it's just like, well, wait a minute now. Who, who you think you talking to? Everybody voice get deeper and all that kind of stuff. And you, know, you don't know me, you know, because people want to perform for an audience. But when there's nobody else there. And it's just the two of you now that are looking eyeball to eyeball and you've started with forgiveness, you can start to make some inroads to really heal from things. Yeah. And you know, and when you schedule that time to sit down with this person, remember, you want to approach it with the gloves off. Yeah. So you're not going into this time of discussion and discourse, you mm. know, already defensive, mm -hmm. you know, with your list of demands and your list of all the things that they did wrong mm -hmm. and all the things you need them to change and how you need them to do things better and, and who you need them to stop talking to and who you need them to start talking to and all that. That's not how you go into this time of discourse. You go into this time of discourse with your ears big. Oh, yeah. Meaning you're going in to listen, mm. to hear what is coming from their heart. What are they saying? How are they seeing things? How are they receiving you? What is their perspective? And when you submit all those other things that you can tend to want to bring to the table to just listening, that starts things off on the right track. Mm. Let, let, let me ask this question. Can, 
can you be okay with peace in your family even though your point maybe was not clearly understood? Maybe you felt like, you know, you know what, what happened to me was, was not fully addressed and nobody really understands. You know, can you live with the peace though? That wait a minute, we've moved past that and we're over into a place with, uh, of, of peace and shalom, harmony, reconciliation together. Can, can you be content with, the, with having that peace and not maybe being fully understood? Sometimes the understanding will come a little bit later. Can you be okay with, you know what, you know, I, I didn't get my way. Uh, I didn't feel like, you know, my side was clearly heard, but I'm so glad now that we are functioning well together in relationship. Can you be okay with that? And if you can learn how to be okay with that, you'll find that many of the relationships in our lives that have these conflicts, the conflicts can quickly be resolved. And listen to me, over a process of time, your position will become clear as well. What, what do we have next, Diana? Well, the next thing we want to share is to pray for peace or for the peace of that other person in the family. Yeah. Um, and, and when we say that, what we're talking about is their growth in God's love for their life and their love for everyone else in the family. So That's you want to, yeah. we're praying for them to grow in God's love and you want to pray for them to grow in love for those um, that are making up your family. You know, our love for others is really an outward manifestation of how we receive God's love for us. So if in these relationships, the relationships with my family, with my spouse, you know, with my coworkers, in these relationships, I am testy, I am judgmental, I am easily offended. It's just speaking to the fact that my relationship with God needs some growth. It, 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 it needs some mending. My relationship with, in my relationship with God, I have not fully received and understood the love that he has for me. Oh, yeah. So we always want to remember what's at the root of any issue that we're having with someone. At the root is not because the person is a horrible person. It's not because the person just don't know how to do right. Not because the person just don't like you or the person just is, is, is not a good person. It's because at the root, that relationship with God needs to be shored up. There needs some, to be some growth and some maturity there. Mm -hmm. So we want to pray for them to grow in that relationship and that will always affect the relationships that they have with others. Now, now what I hear clearly from that is Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So you think the problem is them, and it's not. It's not. You're taking all your anger and animosity and bitterness and rage out on them, and that's not the issue. It's not the issue. And you want to learn how to deal with things at the root, the spiritual root of things, and then recognize that, you know what, they, 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 don't, they don't clearly understand what they're doing. They may be under the influence of something. So you want to deal with things at the root and then learn how to love them despite what has happened. When you do that, come on now, you got great peace going on in the family. Matter of fact, the word of God says there in Philippians chapter 1 verse 8 through 10, this is a good way to pray for the peace. What, what does it say? Babe? It says, for God is my witness how I long for and pursue you all with love in the tender mercy of Christ Jesus himself. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more and extend to its fullest development and knowledge and all keen insight that your love may display itself in greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment so that you may surely learn to sense what is vital and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value. Mm -hmm. And so this is a prayer that you can begin to pray for that person that you might be in conflict with, that person in your family where you actually say, you know, I pray that so-and-so's love may abound yet more and more and extend to its fullest development. So you just put their name in there, in the verse, and that's how you can begin to pray for them. And guess who else you can pray for like this? Yourself. Yeah. Because we always need to grow in our commitment to God and in receiving his love for us. We're never at a place where we have arrived yet. Mm -hmm. We can always do, we can always receive more of God's love for our lives and then have it be expressed in our relationship with others. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. L look at the word of God in Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Because again, these are, 
These are faith fighting keys for fighting for your family. In Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his, God's kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience? Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent, to change your mind and inner man to accept God's will? Come on now, the goodness of God is what leads a person to repentance. See, at the end of the day, you, you want to see, you know, maybe that family member as well as yourself repent. Repent doesn't mean that you feel sorry. You know, I apologize. Well, maybe that needed to happen. But, but repentance means I'm changing my mind. I'm changing my inner man, my inner woman, praise God, to accept God's will. I'm responding to God. And God says, what leads a person to that is not, you know, preaching of condemnation and you're going to go to hell if you don't, you know, do this, that, and the other. He says, no, what leads a person to that is goodness. He says, when they begin to experience my goodness, this is what creates that sense of repentance. And so this brings me to probably maybe my favorite one that's on the list. If you're going to fight for your family in these relationships, bring that person a gift. Bring a gift to the table. Come on, right here in the midst of the conflict, right here in the midst of them talking about you, right here in the midst of this, that, and the other, bring a gift to them. Take some of what you have, come on, some of your money, some of your resources, some of your time, some of your effort, and sow into their lives. You would be wonderfully amazed at how that gift will begin to soften the heart of the person. Now, I can't guarantee that every everyone is going to be like, oh, thank you so much. No, some, some will be honoring and be like, oh, yeah, thanks. Get out of here. They'll still be mad. But that's all right, though. You can't control them. You want to, though, applaud yourself that I'm responding to God. God, God says here his goodness is what leads to repentance. And that's what I want to do. You remember Jesus made the statements over in Matthew chapter 5, you know, verse 44. says, bless those that curse you. Do good to them who, you know, uh, you know uh, despitefully use you. Pray for those, you know, that, that are coming against you. In other words, Jesus says, come on now, do good. Bring a gift to the table. Listen. Uh, I've, I've been in ministry now for a number of years, praise God. I mean, actually, uh, you know, more than a couple of decades. And this has been one of the things that I have counseled people on for years. And I, I've always, a lot of times, get the people, you know, looking at me crazy like, I ain't doing that. Now, I, you know what, Reverend? Uh, you know what? I don't, I don't see that. Show me that in the Bible. And then I show it to them in the Bible, and they be like, well, I still don't know about that, you know. And, okay, you can do that. But those who then have acted on it, I've seen great peace show up. I've seen reconciliations, you know, start to happen. Because anytime you work the word of God, it is always working for you. So if you want to fight for your family members, bring a gift to the table. Be a blessing to them. Yeah, you know, that's, that's awesome. And what I get from that is that, you know, love gives. Oh, yeah. God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world. It didn't say God so loved Christians. It didn't say God so loved the people that served him and that never did anything wrong. It didn't say God so loved, you know, uh, the person that prays 24 hours a day. He loved the world. He loved the people who were full of sin. He loved the people who were far away from him, who weren't even thinking about him, who were doing the opposite of what he had planned for them to do. It said he loved them so much that he gave. But then what did he give? He gave his very best. He gave the only thing that was the most prized possession to him. Yeah. He gave it away to those who were far away from him. Love gives. And it gives regardless of whether you feel the person deserves the gift or not. Love does not demand for someone to work in order to receive its gifts. Mm. So you don't have to correct yourself first before I bless you. Now. No correction is necessary. Mm. It just gives in the midst of the situation that that person is in. And once that happens, it creates and opens the door for repentance, for transformation, and for really uh, restoration. Mm. Because that's what God's love did for us. We were restored for to him because of the gift he gave us. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's, that's good stuff. Listen, 
Respond to God's word. Respond to it. Don't let your mind talk you out of it. Because your mind will say, yeah, but. Get your butt out of there and go ahead and respond to what God says. Listen, we, we, we pray that this is adding some value to you and helping will help you in the relationships in your life. We know that it will because we've applied it ourselves. We've applied it ourselves in marriage. We apply it, you know, with you know, other relationships that we have. And God's word always works when you work it. We give you one more here. We'll finish on this particular point here. And that is what you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says, for godly grief and the pain God is permitted to direct. Produce a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. And it never brings regret. There, there, is, there is something that happens now that produces a repentance from God. A repentance that you get from God that leaves and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. Watch this. It leaves you in a place of no regret. So the last point we want you to focus in on is this. Repent for being wrong. Ah, you don't understand. They're the one that's wrong. Okay, listen. If, if you all are not talking right now, both of you are wrong. You know, if, if you know, you're a married couple and, and y'all laying there, you know, on, on two sides of the bed and, and nobody even want to say good night, come on, both of you are wrong. Even if she started it, you know, I would have to still be a case. <laughs> I still have to be a case now that I, I, I apologize, baby, good, good, good night. You know, I, I love you. Listen, you got to own your part. Yeah, may, maybe the other person's part is 60%, 70%, 80%. Whatever your percentage is, you got to own it. You got to own it and say, you know what? I repent. I'm changing from my thinking in this area. I'm adjusting my inner man, my inner woman to submit to what God is saying now. You got to repent. If you, if you don't repent, listen, all the conversation and the gift giving is not going to make a, a, a big difference because you're still of the same opinion. And when you're still of that same, you know, opinion, contrary opinion, the thing is just going to erupt all over again. You and I have to repent. Babe. Yeah, that's great. You know, and just like you had your hands up like that, we need to go from this to this. Hmm. Come on. I'm not fighting you anymore, but I'm submitting and yielding to God and I'm accepting responsibility I'm accepting responsibility for my part in this situation and you know what this this came to me that I think for certain personality types um you know uh, we talk about you know different biblical personalities and we talk about you know the perceiver and the teacher and you know the person who has a heart of compassion so on and so forth I think there are certain ones of us who find it harder to repent because we think we're right a lot you know we think you know when we look at the facts and we look at what happened we're like okay my logic says that you know I, I tend to be right most of the time mm. and so it's harder for us to repent because you know, we think, you know, I'm right. I'm right here. But what I want to share is, and the, the way that God said it to me is, if you think you are always right and you never have to repent, you might want to check your pride issue. Oh, yeah. That's good. Because nobody is always right. Mm -hmm. Nobody is always 100% not wrong. And it's always 100% the other person's situation, the other person's fault. If you feel like that most of the time, you need to step back and evaluate. Maybe I might be walking in pride here. And so we want to come to the place where we stop doing this and we start doing this. Mm, that's good. Even when I think I'm right, even when I think, you know what, I tend to... Uh, you know, be able to look at a situation and see the right way in and the right way out of the situation. But even though I think that about myself, you know what? Let me do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I surrender. I surrender to God. And you know what? My part, whatever my part was, I repent right now. And we don't do it with an attitude, okay? So we don't say, okay, fine, I repent then. That's no. not repentance. That's not repentance. Mm -hmm. Repentance is... I repent, that's it. 
Mm -hmm. I am pleased to repent in this situation. Yeah, that's good. Come on, right there at, at home. Lift up your hands. Hands wide open because we surrender. And let's collectively repent today. You pray as we pray. Father, we thank you right now that we surrender all unto you. Help us in our thinking where we have been contrary and, and contributed to the conflicts and relationships in our lives. We love our family just like you love us. So help us, Father, to be the peacemakers. Help us to be the ones, Father, to take the steps to, to reconcile. Help us to appreciate your forgiveness at a brand new level so that then we can share that same type of forgiveness with those in our family. Praise God. Help us, Daddy, with, with our mindsets where we may always think that we are right and the other person is the one that's always wrong. Father, help us to be more humble and to recognize our part in the situation and to relinquish it. Praise God. Help the families, Father, that are connected with us on today to walk in a greater sense of peace and unity, love, favor, and power. Daddy, we're declaring that no family member shall be left behind, praise God, that all shall come to a place, praise God, where they are growing fully in Christ. We thank you for this, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen. 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 Come on, somebody just rejoice with us for about 10 seconds right there at home. Father, we bless you and thank you so much, Lord God. You are amazing and your word makes all the difference. And we love you. And we respond to your word today by saying yes and amen. We will do it. So go and do it. Keep doing it and enjoy the benefits of it. We we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Join us on Sunday morning. You can come in person at 9 a.m. or join us online at 9 or 11 as we continue to dig into God's word. Blessings to you. We love you. Bye.